I would like to introduce Alan, who is a president of North Bay uh, Linux User Group. And uh, he is also a software engineer at um, Sienna Corporation. Uh, he also acts as an ambassador to TS Video um, and participate in charity speed running marathon using Taskball. He recently uh, presented at DEFCON and uh, he came back from Shanghai uh, from Geekcon 2016 and is a winner of Geek Thinking Award. So with that, I would like to uh, welcome Alan. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to try the most delicate part for this computer, which is actually plugging in the video. So let's see if this blows up. This happened earlier in practice, too. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not you, it's the computer. I recently, so, as he mentioned, I am the president of the North Bay Linux Users Group. I'm an advocate for running Linux, even when a kernel update makes it so that the NVIDIA proprietary driver occasionally seg faults when you plug in an HDMI cable to the Thunderbolt port, which is the only one I can use because this port doesn't work on this laptop. So, Sometimes corner cases bite you, and that's what happened earlier. Uh, I have to reboot my computer. It's not the end of the world. Uh, I have other solutions in case I literally can't get it back up and running, but uh, this happened earlier today, so I knew I was running some kind of risk. Um, so while I don't have any video here, I have um, a couple of other things I'm going to chat with you about. Um, so first of all, uh, I am uh, the president of the North Bay Linux Users Group. I, uh, I head up a group of Linux users out of the Sebastopol, California, O'Reilly Media Campus. Uh, we meet there every, uh, every second Tuesday of every month. Uh, if you happen to know somebody who would be willing to come up to our direction to speak, we would love to have you. We are looking for any kind of open source or Linux oriented talks. Uh, see if I can do this one handed. Apparently not. Yes. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's always a challenge to find speakers, and uh, if, if you happen to have any interest in coming up, please let me know. Uh, and, what? I don't have anything. Always happens that way. It always seems like, uh, it's the things you don't expect to break that break. I've got a gazillion wires everywhere, which I'll be explaining, and, and usually it's one of these that typically break, but it turns out that we, we had a lot of difficulties with everything from the projector to, uh, <coughs> to trying to get sound that wasn't blaringly loud, but that's okay. Uh, we'll get through this. I have a couple of different ways around this. Uh, so, I want to explain what some of this equipment is. Uh, first of all, uh, these are original consoles from uh, 1985, roughly, and 1990, roughly. It's an old Nintendo, and this is a Super Nintendo. Uh, they're both pretty aged consoles at this, at this point, but uh, still up and running, and still played rather regularly by people who uh, play video games as fast as they possibly can uh, as, as part of speedrun. So one of the interesting things you can do after you've beaten a game is play it again and see if you can beat it faster, and some people make a pretty big deal out of that. Okay, I'm going to set the microphone down and hope this doesn't freak out on me. Yes, okay. Alright. Sometimes it's a small bit, please. Uh, Alright. Uh, now, uh, has anybody here heard of OBS, Open Broadcast System? Well, I'm using it 
as the primary method that I'll be uh, I'll be presenting. So you'll understand in a second. I just have to quickly open up my slides one last time. Since that, I'll shut down too. We'll pass the hard So that makes sense. Uh, well, after you see the complexity of the rest of this, you kind of got to believe me that this is the hard part. <laughs> the rest of it is pretty hard too. I am going to be respectful of everybody's time. I'll, uh, I'll wrap up as fast as I can. see a long time ago. All right, so let's actually get really started. Um, so this talk is about Taskbot. This guy right here is Taskbot. Uh, we'll run, run through this first half pretty quick. Uh, I am also by day a senior engineer at Siena Corporation uh, for now. I uh, am an ambassador, if you will, for taskvideos.org, and I'll be explaining a little bit about what that is. So, I mentioned speedrunning. Well, speedrunning is the practice of playing an old game like Super Mario Bros. 3 as fast as a human could possibly do it. And there's, it's, it's really about just playing games fast. That, now, you've got human skill uh, that, that you can improve as a human, so if you keep playing the same game over and over again, you can get faster. Well, some games actually give you a benefit. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the game um, Super Metroid that you see here actually gives you a uh, different ending graphic, depending on how quickly you beat it. Uh, and there's many categories of people speed run. Uh, maybe it's, uh, they're trying to play just as fast as they can, that's usually called 80%, or they're trying to pick up as few items as possible, that would be a low percent. Uh, now, Speed Demos Archive records these human achievements and categorizes uh, them based on, their, on their, their speed and who did them and things like that. And there's other sites that also track fast completion times. Now, they have very strict rules to avoid cheating. And by cheating, we mean augmenting what a human can do things like controllers with uh, turbo buttons and things like that. And uh, for keyboard PC-based games, there's also macros that they don't want to have in there. And they're typically very entertaining, because you're seeing what can happen at the maximum edge of what a human is uh, capable of. Now, one of the most common places you'll see these is charity events such as Games Done Quick. And Games Done Quick is a week-long marathon of one person after another playing a video game as fast as they possibly can. Well. Uh, the great thing about it is it is a benefit to uh, Prevent Cancer Foundation and, and the winner, and they have a summer event that benefits Doctors Without Borders. They're usually very popular, streamed online. It's like a modern-day telephone. If you remember PBS, they'd be on for a week. You couldn't get rid of them. They tried to make you buy a coffee mug, but it didn't make it go away. Uh, well, this is the same thing. It's a telephone that's broadcast online. Anybody can watch on, on twitch.tv or on gamesthinquick.com. Watch for free, but you can also donate for raffle prizes or incentives like having the players do some really strange things. Um, so sometimes it's just abusing games. You can see here this uh, the, this is a case where they managed to get Yoshi out of bounds, the little green guy there. Uh, sometimes you can do uh, skips like convincing an enemy to go uh, an enemy to go someplace you uh, wouldn't normally be able to get it to go in order to skip past the part of the level. Uh, sometimes there's Restrictions like doing it one-handed. This, this person is only holding a controller with one hand and has a puppet for the other one. Or literally blindfold. And yes, this person really did manage to play Mike Tyson's Punch-Out blindfold, and I think he even managed to beat Mike Tyson. It's a very hard game. Um, so this is beyond what you would typically consider standard human limits. But why stop there? I mean, if, if human limits can only go so far because of reflexes or, or timing, can we push it a little farther, maybe? Uh, and that's where tool-assisted speedruns, or sometimes called tool-assisted superplays, come into play, play. Now, the word task gets thrown around a lot. It basically means tool-assisted speedrun, or you can use it as a verb, a noun, this is a task, sir, this person tasked that. Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, but it's, it's moving to, to the hardware limits. And one of the first ones that did this was the game Doom, where uh, early PC games, they added save states and the ability to record your progress, and they also added slow motion. So what you do is just play the game in slow motion, and if you didn't like the section, you load the, the, the save state and then try again. And you can iteratively build up a result that you were happy with. And one of the most popular ones was Doom Done Quick back in 1999, and later on there was a Doom 2 Done Quicker or something like that that did even faster. Uh, now, in 2003, there was a run from somebody named Morimoto that you might say was a little bit controversial because it wasn't exactly documented very well. 
was released from Japan without a lot of video context, and it was before the days of YouTube. Uh, certainly before it was a, a thing. Uh, so this, this unlabeled video file starts getting passed around, and it shows this person completely doing the most absurd things, getting a, a, a bunch of one-ups and just having really inhuman play. And the problem was that it, it really was done with tool-assisted techniques, in other words, using an emulator to remove human limitations, but it wasn't labeled that way. And, and the thing is, it was in human skill in the display, not human skill. And once you have the ability to do something in slow motion or even one little frame at a time, you've eliminated all the human limits. Now, that meant the tasking looked a little bit like the dope Olympics. And if you're gonna have the dope Olympics, competitors should admit to doping, and videos made with tool assist speedrun techniques should be labeled so you don't get them mixed up, right? So, in 2004, a guy named Bisquick, I think that's how you pronounce his name, created a website named NES Videos to highlight runs made on the original Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. And that, that's now moved over to taskvideos.org, and it has runs for a variety of platforms. Now, early uh, emulation, emulators were highly, highly inaccurate. Uh, but people started doing clean room reverse engineering, or sometimes they just stole manuals, and they started to improve accuracy, uh, such as BSNES and now Hygen that's replaced it, which they don't exactly have the best speed, but they're very accurate to the original system. And that allows us to match what this hardware is doing in an emulator on a frame for frame by frame basis that's at least accurate enough. It maybe isn't perfect, but it's it's close enough. Now, uh, I've placed some limitations on myself for what I'm about to show you. Uh, I'm never going to interfere with the connection between the game and the cartridge, although I do have a, uh, a, an adapter for this type of cartridge. So it's a, a Nintendo uh, cartridge from the US with an adapter to allow it to run in a, a console that was released in Japan, but that's only so I can get better quality video out of it. Um, I'm also, not only am I not interfering with the cartridge, the game itself uh, plays on, uh, or kind of adds some restrictions. There's a couple of games I'm going to show you where it prevents us from pressing up and down or left and right at the same time. And at least for this Nintendo, there's also some really bizarre hardware quirks, which I'll get into later. Now, this guy here is Taskbot. I'm going to talk about the history of what he's doing here in a little bit, but this is nothing more than a robotic operating buddy, or a ROB, released by Nintendo in the United States in 1986. It was a ploy to get into the United States market. The problem was that in 1982, the video game industry completely crashed when Atari allowed third party, well, they didn't allow, they didn't, they were unable to prevent third party uh, game makers, manufacturers, and, and authors from releasing really, really low quality games. And ultimately, they released their own low quality game named E.T., which was so horrendously bad they ended up dumping it in the NA landfill and covering it over uh, millions and millions of cartridges, something like 2 million E.T. cartridges for this game that was just horrendous. And the, the, the industry completely collapsed in 1982. So no retailer, uh, no Sears or uh, a Walmart wanted to take the risk of selling another video game console because it had burned them so badly they'd been left with all these Atari sitting on their shelves that no one wanted to buy. So Nintendo snuck in the back door. They got in the toy section. They made a look at this little robot toy. And if, if I didn't have all this stuff strapped on, I'd show, them, show you that he actually does work. Um, and so the robotic operating buddy was released with the original Nintendo Entertainment System. And they made two games for it and then stopped because that's all they needed. They just needed a foot in the door. So uh, we've taken Rob and we've added a few things to him. And I want to show you what he's capable of doing. So I'm going to set this mic down for just a second. So I'm going to turn this console on. Uh, let me switch my output to... loud enough. That might actually be too loud. Um, so this is an example of a tool assistant speed run. And somebody can turn that down just a touch. Later on I'll actually need to turn back out, but thank you. Uh, so this is showing off uh, a couple things. You might have seen you just actually walked through the wall a little bit. That's not exactly a normal way of getting through this level. So uh, we're just playing a, a tool assistant speed run right now. Uh, so while this is playing back, I'm going to keep going through my slides here. 
So there's a number of, of tools we can use. There are emulators such as FCEUX that emulates the original Nintendo, uh, BSNES, and uh, an emulator called LSNES that handle the Super Nintendo. Uh, BizHawk is a multi-platform that can handle everything from the old Intellivision and ColecoVision consoles, a few other things like that. There's also some bizarre rate recording frameworks. Hourglass is a rate recording framework that works in, uh, in uh, for recording Windows applications. Uh, I made one called NetHack Task Tools that kind of sort of works. Um, yeah, there's a lot of crazy going on a bit. Um, but there's also some really nifty things in some of these some of these tools. There's there's memory searching where you can say I'm trying to find Mario's speed. I want to know what value in memory tracks how fast Mario was moving to the left, either his acceleration or his actual X and Y position on the screen. So we can use memory search tools inside the emulator to uh, say, okay, Mario is standing still. Look for all values that are changing and throw them out. Now start Mario moving and look for all values that are increasing and keep them. And then you can do various different searches to find the exact value that you're looking for. Now, uh, there's other things like Lua scripting, which can really A this, and I'll show you some of that. And you can disassemble the entire original code. Basically, all of these original games were made with, um, with 6502 processor that, uh, that they wrote assembly for. They wrote, they wrote these games with the raw assembly language because it was the best way to do it. Um, so there's more than just frame advance or the act of taking the game and, and kind of like pausing in the emulator and walking forward. There's more than just that. Um, there's also some other tools like Binary Ninja. It's a reverse engineering tool that can be used uh, for some very interesting purposes. Uh, so there were a lot of early console verification devices. Uh, this was a breadboard made by any, uh, by Micro 500. There's a lot of crazy that's going on behind me. There's, you'll understand why in a second. Um, ultimately, Taskbot was born in 2013. This is this little bot here. This is an early picture I had of him where I connected a uh, little circuit board to him. I'm racing against the clock because this thing's about to advance. And this board here that he's holding is the Fastlane board. It's capable of doing four different consoles at once. So. Uh, it's probably the most advanced one, but uh, what I'm showing you now is something we showed at EGDQ 2016 earlier this year. Have a look at what happens here. So I have to ask, what do you guys think we did? Backdoor. A backdoor, huh? Uh, yeah, about that. So a surprising number of people, including Leo Laporte, I, I presented this in a much shortened form and a little bit less wordy. Yeah, I'm not, not exactly uh, keeping my word cam down tonight, but uh, I presented this to Leo Laporte and his reaction was, no, really? He had, how did he leave a back door in this game for so long and nobody noticed it? Well, there wasn't a back door. I'll give you a hint. These right up here are really nifty. They're showing you exactly what buttons we're pressing. Uh, at least in, they're supposed to be. Let's see. One second, let me push, put this down because I think I've got a, something plugged in on the visualization board room. That's the first time I've had that happen. <laughs> These should be uh, lighting up in uh, in alignment with what the yeah what the controller is doing. Uh, actually, I, I think I know why it's wrong. It's my fault. This run doesn't use Y cable. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, I'm going to let this keep going, but I'll, I'll keep talking about some of the other stuff that uh, I want to do. But this is obviously just flat out playing around, right? We're, we're not playing the game normal at all. We're just, we're just messing around. Um, I need to move on because we're a little bit short on time, uh, but we were able to reprogram the game. That's why you saw the funny, weird console with text on it. We programmed in these extra modes that would not normally be in the game at all. Mario cannot normally do the things you're, you're seeing here where he's suddenly changing his, his, uh, 
his appearance and he's suddenly making the shell appear. That's all stuff we added to the game. Because we took over the entire console. Uh, now, I'll get into kind of the how we did it in, in just a second. For now, I am going to shut this one off because we're going to move on. We're going to move on. There, there's more fun things to see. So, uh, here's some screenshots from later on. Um, so, I want to do one other run here. Which I'm going to set the mic down. You have a one record, nothing's where you expect it to be. Okay, we're going to do this again. Uh, no, pardon, we're not doing this again. Hang on. That didn't run at all. I think. Okay, ready to run. Is this expecting a different set of ports? Hang on a second. nifty things about this is we actually have multiple ports we can connect to up to four consoles at the same time, which we did earlier this year at uh, Summer Games Done Quick. Uh, and I thought maybe I had assigned them to the wrong ports, but uh, give me just one second. I'm not sure if I got the right table here. I'm a little bit puzzled because I thought I had all this in one, one folder ready to go. It's like as if I'm in the wrong directory or something. Any button presses at all in here? Nope, nothing. All right. One last thing. Yeah, I should probably do that. Um, I'm quite puzzled. I expect there's a script instead of sending the button presses over there. Yeah, that's the idea. Um, like I was just doing this. Uh, I have all the files on the system. It's like as if. Uh, it's almost like as if there's no buttons being sent. So basically what's happening here is I, the reason I have two laptops, this one's streaming the data through this USB cable here directly to this board. Uh, this board is, is converting the data that's coming from the laptop to a format that the console can understand. At least it's supposed to. Um, there is definitely something a little bit peculiar going on because it's not sending any data at all. So I'm gonna do one other thing here. successfully ran and it didn't work. So, yeah, let me make sure these aren't in the wrong order. All right, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. We'll know, we'll know what to say. All right, cables are actually plugged in now. Yeah, there we go, that's a little better. Okay, oh. all right, this I expect because I just totally screwed with everything. That is called a desync. That's what happens. Uh, that's what happens when um, we end up with, with bad data that's left over in the buffer here, and it starts sending that instead. It's a corner case bug that happens every once in a while when you start plugging things in and removing them all the time. But that's okay. Should work this time. Nope. The LEDs are working now? Oh, that, no, that's really wrong. <laughs> Woo! All right. All right, one more time. Uh, no, there's actually, uh, technically there are. There's, there's two here that are, uh, they're going to player one and player two. These visualization boards, you'll understand in a second why there are four of them. Uh, all right. All right, this should work. I know I just said that, like, I've spent the last five minutes saying this should work, 
but I actually mean it this time, like for reals. This time, for sure, nothing can possibly go wrong. Come on, do it, do it, do it, come on, do it. Oh yeah. There. It's almost like I got the wrong one. Like, I know I said this earlier, but it's, it really feels like I've got the wrong one. It's an extreme fun, I don't know. All right, all right. And, and this is like the cornerstone part of the top, so it's like it's the one thing that we want to do the most. <laughs> Yeah, at least it's consistent. Uh, one more thing. This is not my best talk ever. <laughs> I want to see the state of these lights. Tell me a lot. Okay, that's good. That's what I expect to see. One thing that can happen is when I when I hit that power button, it can pop. Oh no, that's really not doing it right. So let's see, and they're going completely nutty, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. So rather than starting the power one, we're gonna do it from the reset switch, which is fun. This is what I get for just brand new getting this new console that's supposed to show my video a whole lot cleaner and not actually testing it. Uh, we ran out of time beforehand. Yeah, that, that's on our audio side, so go to page 75%. That's an interesting result. Yeah, that's totally wrong. Uh, it, it really is. Oh, 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 wait, wait. Ah, ah. You remember when I said earlier I was testing uh, different files? Yeah, this is what gets me in trouble. I have to say, though, this is quite possibly my worst performance ever. <laughs> uh, usually I get a little bit more time to actually walk through everything ahead of time, so I've just got everything all lined up. That's why I got here an hour and a half early and then spent the whole time trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> how to get everything actually working, but okay, let's try this file instead. That looks better. All right, that looks better. Yeah, I had changed the file on myself. So this one's a slightly different video. Um, I know we just watched this game. This time, uh, you're gonna see something very, very different. He's gonna not try to beat the game right away. Instead, we're gonna take these shells, pick them up, in very, very specific order. What he's trying to do is align these shells on the screen in a very, very specific and important order. And this is what we showed at Geekpone last week. I'm gonna turn the volume up. If I can figure out how. So, this is what we showed at Geekpone. We took over the entire game by literally writing shell code. And I mean that word very literally. We, we took shells, positioned them on the screen in just the right way, and trick, tricked the game into executing what we just did. Now, it doesn't stop there. This is kind of called a demo scene production, if you will. We did a little more than that. We had a composer make this song for us. Uh, and this is a famous song out of China named The Ordinary Road. Um, but, Give it just a couple more seconds. Oh, that doesn't sound good at all. That audio didn't come through very well at all. I can fix this though. This I can fix. I know how to fix this. You know what, that audio is still not quite coming through right though. It's almost like I've got half of it. Uh, this should be a lot higher fidelity than it is. Yeah, talk about everything going crazy. We're just going to turn that down because it's not sounding very good at all. Um, if, you, if you look really close, you'll see that these are uh, really, really 
uh, sending a lot of, of data across. These are actually flashing very fast. Uh, of course, this went perfectly fine in China, and with my luck today, it's not even like playing back. I assure you, it does actually sound amazingly good. We managed to get uh, 52 kilohertz audio through here, and now granted it's mono, but uh, there is something funny going on because I don't even see the video changing. So there's there's definitely the demo gods are being especially evil today. Uh, well. Uh, yeah, I thought this should work. I mean, I thought I actually tested this on this console before I, I modified it. Um, so basically, the only thing that happened here is uh, we took a uh, took this console and it has an NES RGB mod in here to give a much crisper video, uh, which shouldn't affect any of this, but yeah, you know. Well, let me walk through what we just did here. Uh, let me get to the right button here. So uh, this is an example of a script here. Uh, this is an FCEUX script. You see here we all the stuff in green. This is how we helped uh, the guy who was positioning the shells get them in the right order. Uh, we even drew boxes for us so that we could figure out, uh, okay, this shell needs to be moved to this location. So this is us looking into memory to figure out where things need to be. Once we aligned all the shells in exactly the right place, we were able to uh, execute uh, a little glitch with this DPC and audio conflict. So here's what happened. This original Nintendo has a bug in the hardware. It, the bug is that if you're playing a certain type of audio at the exact same time that you are asking the game or the controller for input, they collide on an open bus and it loses parts of what, uh, what buttons you're trying to send. So to work around that, they ask the game, the game asks the controller for input twice. It says, hey, what are you holding, what buttons are being pressed? And then it says, okay, tell me again what buttons are being pressed. And if they don't match, it throws away the first result and asks again. And it keeps repeating that pattern until two in a row match. Well, we make sure they never match, ever. We keep it so busy that uh, we're able to uh, overwrite the data in the stack because it hasn't done certain things. Uh, we, we, we do it for several seconds in a row, overwrite all the data in the stack. If you remember your old 6502 programming, that's, yeah, I won't try to get into that, I don't have enough time, but uh, eventually what happens is we stop sending that and execution drops to the bottom of the stack, roughly, and it runs into the data where our shells were, and it runs a simple routine. Now, our simple routine, um, actually I'm gonna go back up here for just a second. Uh, if you're really good with your assembly, the first three bytes are saying go jump to the subroutine that asks for the controller input, and whatever value you get, go store in this value in memory based on this offset of, index, offset of uh, an index. So it basically stores it in an area of memory. The next bit increases the offset, so the end result is you write a byte to memory, then you write the next byte to memory, or byte to the next byte to memory, and so on and so forth. And the last one through says uh, break if, there, if you're not holding any buttons at all. So we're able to write one byte at a time by pressing different buttons on the controller. But there's a challenge here. Remember that whole, you can't press up and down or left, left and right at the same time? We don't like that because it kind of limits us. As is, when we start that first stage, we're only able to get about 60 bytes a second. But when we get, uh, we kind of want to increase the speed. That, that takes a while to write something useful. So we write this extra little bootloader that removes the problems we have with pressing left and right or up and down at the same time, which by the way means that we have entire byte combinations we can't even write. Um, we also disable interrupts, which are would cause us trouble if we didn't, and, and we disable the thing that caused our, our, our problem with DPC and audio in the first, in the first place. Uh, that allows us to write arbitrary values at about mm, 1.7k per second, kilobytes of data transferred across a wire per second, which far exceeds the 480 bytes that this, this system was normally capable of. Um, so then we, re uh, we write this, execute the stage three we just ran, or just wrote. That reads one controller extremely fast, about 7.27 kilobytes per second, and it stores the data in an area of memory that would normally be battery backed up, except this game doesn't have a battery. The game just had that memory there for it to store data while it was running. Well, we abuse that to our own advantage and write our own payload there. And that's where we write this, this Geekpone logo. Um, so we in initialize our own music engine, and we had a composer uh, write a version of that song for the original Nintendo sound capabilities. But that, we don't stop there. Uh, this is where, normally, when things are going completely nutty on me, 
um, we're able to play back audio, and uh, we're using a Y cable method. The reason I have four controllers here is we've told it, hey, NES, you have a multi-tap attached to your first controller port. Now, multi-tap was this device that allowed you to have four controllers connected at once for four-player games like Bomberman. And normally it worked by having all four of them connect to this little box, and then one wire would go to the first controller port. Well, we've told it it has a multi-tap on each controller port, which would technically going to save controllers, but you can only read two of them simultaneously per multi-tap. So we give it two multi-taps, which means we can read four controllers at the same time. That gets our data rate up to an astounding 520 kilobytes per second, which is far beyond anything that this console was ever expected to do. And that allows us to do things to the audio chip that have never been possible. The original game cartridges were usually in the range of about 128K total, just the ballpark. Some were bigger, some were smaller. But we're sending 520 kilobytes per second of audio. So we're exceeding the audio capacity, or audio ability of, of what this console was able to do. Normally it would sound a whole lot better than that. So, um, all right, we're, we're gonna do a shift here. I know we're coming up on uh, a little bit late, so I'm gonna be respectful of your time, but I got one more thing I wanna show you here. So let's move to that real quick. Okay, so we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna have, have Pass Out Play Super Mario World. So that's this cartridge we have right here. the volume just a little bit so you can actually hear it. Oh, wait a minute. Did I remember to delete the game? I probably didn't. I probably forgot to delete the game. So this has a game save in it. Uh, exit. Dell. Dell save. There we go. So I need to go in and delete the save game that was created. There we go. All right. Let's try that again. I'm going to pay attention to make sure I know it's doing the right thing. So this is a Super Nintendo. This, this console came out in 1990, roughly. Is he facing the right direction? I think he is. Like, you get to the point where you watch these over and over again, and you start to memorize most of the details, but we've redone this game a few times, so I'm trying to remember if that's the right thing to, that should happen, but... Yeah, that's the right thing. So, uh, this is going to be doing something very similar to the last run you saw. We're going to move a bunch of objects around in very weird ways. Now, you're supposed to only have one Yoshi at a time, but we kind of break the game a little bit. Uh, so we actually are sitting on more than one Yoshi right now. Um, we break the game a lot. Now, the reason for moving back and forth, we're trying to despawn things off out of memory. So in order to conserve memory, it only keeps track of a certain number of objects. And this is just us messing around, because we, we, this, this charging chuck, we're like this close to being hit, from, hit by him. We just keep messing with him. Right about there. So, are you keeping track of your games? Um, it, it, has anybody ever played this game? All right, come on up. Sorry, this isn't fair. You're playing with the delay. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's hard, but 
It makes it harder to play, but this is the real thing. We literally programmed Super Mario Bros. 1 for the original Nintendo on top of Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo. So a game designed for this that I have, just, just, just for the sake of legality, uh, I do own the actual game, it is here. And I also have a cartridge reader in here so that I can read the contents of it, so therefore I'm not breaking any laws. Um, <laughs> uh, this was a pretty interesting hack. We only barely were able to fit the original game in, and we cheated and reused the audio that the game already had because we decided it sounded better. Yeah, you're doing a pretty good job. Despite the fact that it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to... I'm gonna mess with you though. Ah, you just got smaller. Um, so, this wasn't Taskbot Play Super Mario World. This is Taskbot Play Super Mario World in Super Mario Brothers. And if you know these icons, you know how, how much this must be messing with some people. This probably makes some people's brain hurt. It, it, yeah, yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, sorry, I gotta kick you off, but they're gonna kick me off. <laughs> You're just getting better. It's pretty hard when there's that many frames of delay. All right, so let's set this down one more time. exact same skills you need for a security research, infosec, reverse engineering background. And honestly, we're just using different vernacular. I mean, a safe state is really about the same as a VM snapshot. Frame advance, if you've ever done this kind of work, if you've ever captured a, a virtual machine in a specific state and done a CPU tick, it's basically the same thing. Uh, a glitch that we find in the game, we just treat it as another vulnerability that can be exploited. Um, and that's exactly what arbitrary code execution, which was what we just did, is. Uh, console verification is a lot like an evil meta tech. We are acting exactly like this controller in every way. We just don't have very honorable intentions half the time. Uh, it's really pretty similar. So, a tool assisted speedrun can be fun and educational and really, really tricky. But I want to show you one other thing. I have a, 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 a book up here, uh, or a, a journal that we wrote an article for. This is a, a rather weird journal with a very unfortunate name. This is uh, the Journal of Proof of Concept or Get the F Out. Um, <laughs> the reason for that is a lot of security journals, you have to pay a lot of money to, to get them, and they don't even tell you a lot about how uh, something was attacked. So this is different. This is, it's free, and if you don't tell them how you actually did it, they won't publish it. So we have an article in here that describes this, and this is a game called Pokemon Red, you might recognize it. This is a Game Boy game for a uh, console, a handheld console. This is gonna go inside of this Super Game Boy cartridge. And the Super Game Boy cartridge has a Game Boy inside of it, believe it or not. So this emulates a Game Boy, sort of. I mean, it's actually not emulating, it is the real hardware. And allows you to play a handheld console game on a Super Nintendo, which we're about to do. All right, let's turn this on. I did this to myself earlier, too. I'm just going to go full screen. So, uh, this is going to take a few minutes, but if everything works right, it'll be worth it. Uh, so this is a game called Pokemon Red. Uh, you can see that the actual part of the game is the part inside this border. The stuff on the outside is a Super Game Boy border they added in uh, with only when you were playing the uh, game. Hello! You're going to go? That doesn't look right. It should have deleted the save game by now. Hello? No one's home. Did I forget to type sudo? I forgot to type sudo. Windows be one, 
it should be it. Yeah. Let's see if these actually do anything. If I don't see any button presses on here, then I know it's not actually sending anything. It takes a while to get through this intro. Yeah, it's not detecting anything. Did I get my cables mixed up again? I don't think so. I just ran... Uh... This is acting a lot like I got my cables backward again. <laughs> I did unplug them when I, did, uh, when I handed this controller over, so... Let's see how evil the demo gods are to me this time. It would be my own fault if I did it. The roughest I've ever had a demo. <laughs> So many ways to shoot myself in the foot. Now, lights are off, and are we doing anything today? Yes, we're actually doing something. Yay. <laughs> so it's, it's starting the game right. Uh, this one is a very different way of going about it. So we're actually starting from a midpoint. We've already started with save game that has zero Pokemon in it, except it doesn't. We earlier we brought it earlier, and that allows us to move Pokemon over the items list. And so you can see it's a very visceral way of understanding what we're looking at inside the game here in a second. We're, we're wandering around at an item list in memory that is one byte for which item it is and one byte for how many of them you have. And we just copied data from Pokemon we don't have into items we didn't have. And it overwrote the item length list with the value 255. So we're delving into uh, items like this TM25. That's just some random value, random byte in memory that's sitting there. And the quantity that follows is something that we can throw away. So we're altering every other byte by walking in here and literally throwing things away to decrement that byte in memory to exactly the value we want. Now, that means we can modify every other byte, but uh, to get to the point where we can modify the, the bytes that are currently the... Uh, I'm going to turn this down because there's no actual value to this audio. Um, the, the, what we want to do is uh, go back to the Pokemon menu and switch to Pokemon, and it offsets memory by an odd value. So what used to be a identifier is now a quantity, and what was a quantity is now an identifier. And when we do that, uh, we can eventually line a very specifically written sequence of bytes up in memory uh, so that we can do a very similar exploit to what you saw earlier. Uh, what we're doing here is uh, writing a payload that will escape the Super Game Boy and go run code in the Super Nintendo. Uh, as you can see, there's some graphical glitches. It took us a long time to figure out the right path for the game so that it wouldn't crash. Because some items, if you even look at them in the menu, it will crash the entire game, which is not fun. You're basically trying to do a here. Yeah. Well, the way I would describe it is, well, it's probably pretty crazy right now. Oh, no, that's a decent. Ah. Uh, uh, That didn't work. <laughs> so this is what happens when it desynchronizes. That was the point where uh, it should have escaped, and it has in the past. Man, I am having the worst demo ever. Um, what, what's supposed to happen is this. Um, we eventually escape the, the uh, Game Boy entirely, the Super Game Boy, and we have the ability to execute our own code with Super Nintendo, and we write a chat client, a Twitch chat client, directly into memory, and subsequently connect it to the internet, and allow anyone who wants to communicate to type into it into a chat channel, and it appears on the Super Nintendo's screen. 
And we did some really, really crafty things to make that data rate a little bit higher. But I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up here. Yes, we sent all the data just over the controller. So I was going to do Q&A over that interface, except it didn't work. And we're also running late on time. So um, I'll take your questions normally. So I was going to have you guys uh, connect to that. You, you still can. Um, and I can see that if you want to do this, if you want to connect to chat.passbot.net from any device you have, uh, I'll be able to see anything you type. But uh, let's just ignore that for the moment. So all right, what's the punchline of all this? What the heck am I up to? Am I cheating? Not really. No, I'm, I'm in it for the technical uh, challenge. Really. It's, it's pretty hard to release. The, the Super Game Boy exploit was probably a man year of effort. But why am I doing this in reality? Because we've done five charity events, and the portions that we've helped organize have helped raise over $200,000 for charity. That's why I've done this. Because we're entertaining people to the tune of Usually uh, over 100,000 people, and earlier this year we did an event in January uh, that benefited the Prevent Cancer Foundation, and there were 196,000 people watching the live stream that, uh, that we were presenting in front of. Um, just this summer we did one for Doctors Without Borders, which is a fantastic organization, and we have about an hour block of time, and in one hour we, we helped raise over $42,000 for, uh, for Doctors Without Borders. This has been the most life-changing thing I've ever done. Uh, usually it's not quite this difficult to make it happen. <laughs> I do apologize for all of the technical issues that I had hoped to iron out well in advance of coming here. Um, there's obviously a lot of people involved in this. I'm not the only person. I needed one person to physically develop the hardware, one person that uh, wrote the actual payloads you saw on the screen. So in other words, one person actually wrote the code that allowed us to copy Super Mario Brothers in the Super Mario world. Another person made the chat on it. Uh, another person made a square filter so that when we did this text uh, that was getting displayed on the screen, we wouldn't end up with people writing really offensive things. Uh, and trust me, if you've ever been on Twitch chat, you know what I mean. They are some of the most violently disgusting human beings ever. ever but, um, had somebody who wrote the actual protocol to send the data across the USB into a serial format that this device could handle. Uh, somebody else rearranged the shells in the right order in Super Mario Bros. 3. Uh, and there's just a team that goes on and on across the country, across the world, really. There's about five different countries that were, were involved in the uh, music when we did the Geek Phone. Yeah, everything from Russia to Finland to the UK. And, and we do all of our work on IRC in a text-based format because we're never awake at the same time. So uh, it, this has been a, a truly life-changing experience for me, and I have to say thanks to a lot of people. Uh, they have various different handles, but uh, yeah. Um, that, that's about it. I, uh, I will gladly answer any question you have in the next seven minutes. Let's, 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 let's cut this off in seven minutes. So, go for it. So let me restate the question for the mic. Uh, the question is, how did we manage to get Super Mario Brothers running on a Super Mario World when they're different consoles? The answer is, it has a very similar processor. The 8-bit Nintendo has a 6502 that can only address one byte at a time. The Super Nintendo can address 16 bytes, I'm sorry, bits, bits. 8-bit, 16-bit. This one can address 16 bits, or two bytes at, at once. But you can place it in an, in an old mode. Can force that, that processor to remote mode where it mostly does things in 6502, uh, most. The problem though is the data is stored in memory in a very, very funny way. So we got around that by uh, rotating all of the graphics from the original cartridge into pre formatting them in a different way. And we had to rewrite the entire sound engine because that didn't line up at all. The sound processor between the two was very, very different. So we wrote a lot of our own code uh, that used all of Nintendo's assets. Now, Nintendo has generally frowned on this kind of thing, but they let it slide for us, I guess. We've never had a letter from them. <laughs> but, yeah. So, how does the taskbot know, like, how does it synchronize? Like, how do you know when it starts? So the question is, how does taskbot synchronize? Well, that's partly why you saw everything go so wrong today. Um, and there's, there's a number of things that could be going wrong here. Uh, everything from power, you name it. Because the only visibility the taskbot has, he's blind, can't see a thing. The only visibility he has is what he's asked for button presses. So 
here's how one of these controllers works. Technically, I'm going to describe the Nintendo variant of this one. It's only got eight buttons on it, and it's a little easier. So the console will send a, a, a signal on a line called the latch line, and it'll say, hey, latch, raise it high. Uh, so it goes from zero voltage to one volt, uh, or sorry, no voltage to voltage. And that triggers the shift register on the controller. It says, hey, controller, I'm about to ask you what buttons you're, pre you're, you're pressing right now. Clock. There's another line that has a clock on it that's headed to the controller. Clock. Give me the first button. Is uh, A pressed? And the controller has a serial line out, and it says, yes, A is pressed, so A is 1. Uh, so it sends a 1. And it says, clock. Give me the next button. Is B pressed? Oh, 0. It's not pressed. And it does that 8 times. A, B, L, uh, uh, a, B, select, start, left, right, up, down. In that order. Or something like that. A, B, S, L, U, R. No, it ends with R. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, so every time it asks, if it presses latch, we know that it wants to ask the game after the, the game is asking the controller for input. However, on the Super Nintendo, I'm sorry, on the original Nintendo, there's that APC audio glitch, so it's actually going to ask us more than once. So we have to keep track of how much time has passed. So we put it in a window mode, and if it asks again too soon, we know that it must be uh, asking because it ran into this glitch. So we give it the same input a second time. So we keep track of, of time and of time elapsed and how many latches it's asked for, and use that as a mechanism to see what order things are happening. You can think of it this way: he has no artificial intelligence at all. He simply knows how to play the game perfectly. Okay. Uh, Sorry, question. Uh, what It's, it's like someone memorizing the exact sequence in a play, or knowing every line that they're going to speak at an opera, or something like that, except he does it absolutely perfectly. So when something goes wrong, it's not his fault that the world changed out from underneath him. He's doing exactly what he was told. So yeah, it's true. Usually with some hilarious downsides when things go wrong, like the weird graphic glitches you saw kind of distorted things over here. I saw a question in the back over there somewhere. So when you develop the scripts, you do it all with emulator and yeah. the final test? We, we do all of our initial development with emulators, usually FCEUX or LSNES, and then after we've tested a little bit, we use a script to convert the movie file or the series of buttons that are pressed at the emulator, convert that in a way that it can run on the uh, original hardware. So we, we convert it to a method that we can convert through the spot. And this isn't the only value we can do this. We've had a number of different designs, and in fact, there's a design that we're coming up with that will allow us to do it with this $10 dev kit board. It's a, a PSOC. Uh, it's a, a cheap little board. And uh, so this will be a lot of fun to play with. We've already got a prototype that works. We just need to figure out how to mass produce it a little bit. But quite honestly, there's only like a couple dozen people in the world that actually care. Yeah. Uh, what are the protections against doing this on later generation consoles? Like uh, later generation consoles, we've done uh, Nintendo 64. Uh, we've technically done GameCube, but we haven't. We actually used the GameCube to do a Game Boy Player Player run. Uh, but I'm really glad you asked that, because if anyone who hear, hears the sound of my voice, even if you're listening to this later, if you have access to a NES Classic Mini that just came out last week, we want to talk to you, because we haven't been able to buy one. And trust me, when I say we haven't been able to buy one, I mean I took Passbot to the game stop, and we were 11 in line when they had 10 in stock. So, which is really frustrating. If you can get us an NES Classic Mini, we will destroy it. <laughs> well, like, well, we won't break your unit, I promise. But we really want to get our hands on, on some of the newer stuff. But in all practicality, uh, we can do Mario Kart 64 or Super Mario 64 for the Nintendo 64. A lot of newer disc-based consoles are literally impossible for reasons that actually make a lot of sense if you think about it. Optical media, when you put it in, is not necessarily going to be aligned at the same place. And as the disc spins, Rotational forces aren't necessarily always going to allow that disc to uh, be read at exactly the same speed every time. And if the game asks for input at the same time it's also reading the disc, and it blocks waiting for that disc to be read, you get desynchronized. So we have some potential ideas of copying that data to uh, storage media that is very consistent, but that's it's kind of difficult. And also, a lot of the newer consoles simply aren't emulated well enough to have the level of accuracy required. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible. So we're, we're definitely looking into those options. Uh, what other tools or methods did you find, you know, the bugs and the code, you know, for all the running or something? 
I mentioned it earlier, uh, some of the other tools we used were Binary Ninja. Binary Ninja is a very, very useful general purpose tool that can be used for reverse engineering applications and it happens to have an NES mapper in it, or specifically the ability to dissect 6502 code. We were able to use that to dissect exactly how the sound, or how the DPC and audio glitch work. And you can find more information at fuzyll.com. Puzzle, it's this word right here, puzzle.com. He did a full write-up of, of how that happened. Uh, have you looked at trying to synchronize the video at all, or is that most of the Yes, actually we have. Um, I don't have it in my box, but we, have, we developed a little board that can detect the V-Sync signal coming out of the console, and it turned out to be completely worthless. <laughs> because we already have that same information based on paying attention to the latches coming from the controller. They, at least in our experience, the V-Sync did not give us any additional information. Now, I'm handing the mic to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your uh, uh, kind, uh, um, uh, kind participation in a very difficult demo. And we really appreciate how all of us who've been through demos know uh, how difficult that is. And by the way, I was on the the, the, the game development team uh, at the Magnavox Odyssey uh, oh, yeah. headquarters. 